All right. Dr. Dave Ingram is a professor emeritus who joined the UNC Chapel Hill School of Medicine Pediatrics Department in 74 after training in pediatrics at Yale and pediatrics infectious diseases at Harvard. He practiced and taught at Wake Med and UNC and was on call 24 seven as Raleigh's only pediatric infectious disease doctor for 43 years. He helped establish the Wake Med Pediatrics Teaching Program and literally helped train nearly every pediatrician who did a residency and went into practice here at that time. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Ingram. Thank you and good evening. First, I will review some of the basics about the COVID-19 pandemic, and then we'll open up for all your questions, which I look forward to. First, let us review what is actually known. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic started in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. That's only five months ago. It was caused by a new virus called SARS-CoV-2. Those letters stand for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, which probably originated in bats, mutated and adapted to a scaly mammal called a pangolin which in China is eaten, and the scales are used for medicinal purposes. Then the virus mutated again and adapted to humans, dogs, and the cat family. Its spread is in the air by infected droplets, which can travel about six feet before they fall to the, the flat surface. Or in the wind, if you're downwind of somebody, these droplets can carry for up to 18 feet or they can even go further if you cough or sneeze to about 23 feet. The second method, which is probably less important, is that can spread to you by contact from your hands that have touched an infected surface, and then you've taken your hands and touched your face, eyes, nose, and then when the virus gets in your nose, it travels to your lungs where it attaches to lung cells, and infects them and then continues to spread. It also then goes into the bloodstream and infects the cells lining the blood vessels. This is very important in this syndrome because what happens when the lining of the blood vessels get irritated by this infection, it causes clots to form. And these clots can then break off and spread in tiny little clots to your heart, to your kidneys, to your brain, to your gut as well as to your lungs, or they may form large clots in the big blood vessels and veins in your legs, then go up, break loose, go up through your heart and land in your lungs, causing severe damage to your lungs and severe hypoxia because the blood's not circulating in your lungs. These viruses not only infect the blood vessels, lining cells, but they can also infect the brain, the GI tract, the kidneys and the lungs, and possibly the heart. The body's immune system attacks the viruses and the infected cells, producing inflammation, which kills not only the viruses, but the infected cells. Part of the process includes making antibodies to cytokine and cytokines. Sometimes the inflammation is very severe, causing what's called a cytokine storm. This means, when you hear this on television, this, what it really means is that your immune system is extremely robust and attacks the virus infected cells and causes them to die, the cells to slough off, many cells to pour into the lungs, a lot of fluid to pour in from the damaged vessels. And essentially, this builds up a lot of fluid in your lungs and asphyxiates you. Symptoms in people with COVID-19 infection are as follows. 50% are asymptomatic with no symptoms at all and they can spread the virus to others. These are the ones that cause a lot of trouble when you're trying to control the spread of the virus. 30% of people get a mild illness, some with fever, cough, shortness of breath, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of taste and smell, chest pain, muscle aches, and headaches. So you can have all the above, some of the above, few of the above. About day five or six, 20% of people get hospitalized. Then you develop pneumonia or infection in your lungs. You go into multi-system failure. Your heart starts to fail. Your kidneys stop working. Then you go into shock, coma, asphyxia, and confusion. 
around day 10 or 11, 5% overall will die. This varies extremely depending on your age and whether you have what are called comorbid problems, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, chronic problems with lungs, cancers, and problems, any problem that might lower your immune system's ability to fight the infection. This is an important table that I'm going to go over with you. It's the risk of death if you get uh, this infection. Children luckily rarely have symptoms or death. The problems really starts when you become adults. If you're under 49 years old, about five in a thousand people that get infected will die. When you move up to another bracket, it triples. So from 50 to 59, 14 out of a thousand will die. If you move up into the 60 to 69 year age group, it jumps to 36 out of a thousand. The big jump comes when you get into the older groups. When you jump, it'll jump from 36 per thousand to 130 per thousand if you're in the 70 to 79 year age group. If you get in my age group, 80 plus years old, the chance of dying from getting this infected can be anywhere from 13 to 20 percent, or one out of five will get this, who get this disease will die. Of course, a lot of people will, who die in these high age groups have the comorbidities that we talked about, such as diabetes and hypertension, but not all. Other syndromes with COVID-19 are stroke syndromes in 20 and 30 year olds. So this means that the blood vessels get damaged, clots form, and these clots fly into the brain as they break off in the blood vessels. There's a new syndrome called multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Luckily, this is a rare syndrome. There are about 100 cases in New York right now, and three of these children have died. This is a much more acute illness. It comes on in children who've either had the virus, do have the virus, or exposed to somebody with the virus. What they develop is fever, a combination, or some of the above, or all the above, a fever, a diffuse rash, red eyes, severe abdominal pain, severe enough to be considered possibly appendicitis. Then they go into sudden heart failure and shock. And then this whole system of those who die can be, go from well to dead in a matter of a few hours instead of over a week or so, like adults. High risk of symptoms or death, again, include over 65 years old, hypertension, chronic heart or lung disease, diabetes, or cancer. People of color have two times the death rate of those who aren't people of color. And this is probably due to the fact that people of color often have jobs where they work with other people, where people not of color are more likely to have jobs where they can work from home. Poor neighborhoods, it's, it's the same effect. They have over 40 times the infection rate of people who lived in zip codes of the wealthier. People in confined places have the highest rate of infection, such as these people are people in jails, nursing homes where a third of our deaths come from, ships, meat processing factories, and healthcare workers in hospitals. There are places where People have to work with exposure for as many as up to eight hours a day. You only need a thousand viruses to get infected, a thousand viruses that get into your lungs. So if somebody coughs right in your face or sneezes in your face, you'll get millions of particles of viruses. If you're a cashier in an enclosed space like a grocery store where there's chronic exposure of very low levels of virus, over many hours, they may get up to that 1,000 number and get infected. If you want to keep from getting ill, stay away from people, six or more feet away from them. You're going to wash your hands a lot, and you're not going to touch your face. You're going to wear a mask, such as a cloth mask. But remember, this mask doesn't protect you. It's to protect others by deflecting the particles that are coming out of your, when you exhale in breathing to the sides rather than forward. Remember, 
that healthcare workers wear a lot more than this. They wear face shields, they wear face masks, gowns, and gloves, and they still get infected. So this is a very infectious virus and it's hard to protect yourself from it. There are two types of tests that you hear talked a lot about on television. The first is an antigen test for the virus itself. This test has lots of problems. One, a lot of the tests haven't been cleared by the FDA and they're not very good. There's a high number of false positives and a high number of false negatives. For instance, the one made by Abbott that's used for people working in the White House has a 50% rate of false positives. So it misses 50% of people that are infected. Also, if you, if you sample early in the infection, such as the first day, about most tests are about 40% false positive. By the third day, it goes down to about, for many tests, down to about 20% false negative. So false negatives, you might think the person is not infected and not spreading the virus, it can be wrong. The second test is looks for immunity or antibody formations, the antibody testing. And there again, there are problems with false positives and false negatives. There are many people who have very clinically obvious COVID-9 infection and they have negative tests for antibodies and, and for antigens. So the next question is that if you have antibodies, nobody knows if you're protected and if so, for how long? So if you're going to try to get an antibody test to see if you're immune, you will not get that information from it, even if it's positive. Treatment that works consists of giving oxygen to people who need it, hydration and feeding. If things get really severe, like in the top 5%, people that get infected, they'll go on a respirator. A respirator, in, if you go on a respirator in New York City, your chances of living are 10%. So though a lot of work is put into trying to help people with respirators, the outcome is quite poor. Remdesivir may shorten the hospital course. It's an antiviral agent that's now being distributed, which may help. Although in the control group, the group that didn't get the remdesivir in their series, the mortality was 11%, which was only reduced to 8.6% if they got the treatment. So it's not a magic bullet. Hydrochloroquine doesn't work and is dangerous. And then in some people it causes arrhythmias of the heart. Plasma is being tried. Uh, these are taking plasma from blood from people who've been infected and have antibodies levels. We don't know yet if it works but it's being tried. Tocilizumab is a, another agent that dampens the inflammatory response, and it seems to reduce inflammation, and hopefully it's going to help, but that also is being tried. Another medicine that's being used is an anticoagulant, because one of the major problems with this disease is that it causes clots, and then the clots cause a lot of damage as they break loose and fly around them in the circulatory system and land in various organs. So people are putting, been put on heparin and they're trying to figure out now whether high dose heparin or low dose heparin is going to work. If you go to UNC hospital, you will get heparin. Vaccination is the big hope. Um, lots are being tested now. The earliest that it might be available is six months, which is optimistic. Most people think it's gonna be about one to one and a half years. Now, what is really important, what seems to be ignored sometimes, is what is not known. Important unknowns are the following. Are you immune if you've been infected? And if so, for how long? I.e., can you get infected a second time? This answer is still out. For instance, on the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt, there were a thousand sailors that got infected. They were taken ashore and weren't allowed to return to the aircraft carrier until they had two negative viral antigen tests. 15 of those got sick again and had developed positive tests. So the question is, did they get reinfected or was their test a false positive? So that question is still up in the air as to whether you can be reinfected again. The next unknown is, will an antibody, tell, tell, tell you, <laughs> antibody test tell you if you're immune? 
So just because you have antibodies does not guarantee that you're going to be immune. The third question is, when is it safe to be with people again? Well, that's a matter of what risks are you willing to take? Hopefully, uh, what will help people make a decision to, about going back to being among people again will be that there's an effective vaccine or there's an effective treatment, both of which are not available at this time. Will vaccinations work? And if so, for how long? Every year we have to have a new influenza vaccine because the virus mutates and the old vaccination doesn't work. So are we going to have to get more than one vaccine a year or every year or every five years? That question is not known. Is COVID-19 here to stay? Is this virus going to be circulating, in the, especially in the winter time, year after year? Some people think so. Time will tell. What will treat the virus effectively? We don't have any very effective treatments yet. Some are being tried now, seem to help a little bit, but there are no magic bullets that pretty much guarantee that you're gonna get better if you get sick with this disease. If there's a, the other question is, if there's a vaccine that works in young, healthy people, work, will it work in the most vulnerable people, i.e. old people, or those with diabetes, hypertension, chronic heart or lung disease, or cancer? This is unknown. We do know that, for instance, with influenza vaccination, that the older you get, the less likely the vaccination is going to work. So in, in many years, it might work 60 or 70 percent of the time in young, healthy people, but less than 20 percent of the time in old people. So we've reviewed both the, what's known and what's unknown. Um, there's a lot that's going to be coming out in the future. And I wanted to go through a quick review, and now I look forward to taking your questions.